so much light, mm -hmm. um, so much purity, so calm, so beautiful. I don't know which other words to use. It's just like really, really, really nice. I know that some girls are still not here, but people are joining. So welcome everyone, Michelle, Dorit, Janina, very nice. Hopefully I can say everybody's name. And you know, I was thinking, you can think, wow, the last night of Hanukkah, it's kind of sad. Hanukkah is finishing, it's true. But then when you look at the menorah and you see so much light, we have to say, well, it's not sad. It's good we reach to that day. We reach to the day that we have so much light. And now, as we call this class today, we call it Hanukkah Inspiration. We want to see how we the inspiration can continue. How can we... Sorry, I thought my little girl was behind me here. How can we continue the inspiration of Hanukkah? How can we continue that beautiful light that we were lighting every day? We started with number one, right? Um, perhaps some of us know that but the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Mishnah, we had two um, house of studies. We had Beit right. Hillel and Beit Shammai, right? Mm -hmm. Beit yes. Shammai and Beit Hillel. Beit Hillel, um, many laws we do as Beit Hillel, many as we do as Beit Shammai. With Hanukkah, is the study, Hillel and Shammai were two great sages. You probably know, many of us know the known story that a person came uh, wanted to convert and he came to Shammai to the Tzadik and he said, I want to convert and I want you to tell me the whole, how can I learn actually not convert? How can I learn the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot? He can't stand on one foot for too long. So obviously he wanted to have the core. Yes, Shammai said, like with him and he said, what? <laughs> how can you learn Torah with a one foot? He says, like he with a stick, he told him, go away. You, you don't want to learn Torah, you're making fun of me. How can you learn the whole Torah in one foot? When the, gen, the same man came to, to, to Hillel, so Hillel looked at him and he said, you know, I'll tell you what it is. It's an Aramaic. Whatever you don't want, whatever you hate, whatever you hate that should be done to you, don't do it to your friend. Basically, loving a fellow man, loving a fellow Jew as you love yourself. If you don't want something like this to be done to you, everything that we try to do to a friend, to a spouse, to a person, to a parent, to a child, if I didn't want that to happen to me, if I didn't want mom to do it to me, then let me not do it to my child or other, you know, all those things. And that's what Hilo told him. And it's so true. You know, when we think about someone else, then we'll do all the mitzvot because we want to we want to do what Hashem wants us to do. Why? If I love a fellow Jew, how do I love Hashem? Because it says that when you love, the Torah says, when you love a fellow Jew, you love a fellow person, then you love what Hashem loves. And this is a greater love. When you, in our relationship with our, let's say with our spouses, right, with our friends, Many times you don't feel like doing something, but you're doing it because you know that your spouse, that your friend really enjoys and really wants it, and you're Call doing it from because of them. To light when you love, when you love another person, when you do things even though you don't feel like it, but you're doing it because Hashem wants you to do it. This is the whole Torah. Then you don't feel like keeping Shabbat, but you're doing it because Hashem wants the same thing as you love someone else because Hashem wants. And this is Hillel was more love, kindness, and Shammai was a little bit more strict. A lot of the world being was more strict. So according to Shammai, the first night, you just start Hanukkah. So you do eight candles. The second night, you do seven and six, then, right? And then the last night, you light only one because Hanukkah is finished. Hillel says, no, you start with one candle. And then you add, and you add. And you add, and you add, and every night you add, till the eighth night, we have eight candles of Hanukkah. It looks like it's And that is the opinion that we do like Hillel. We do like Hillel, every day we add. And that's why tonight, I was thinking, you know, with starting the class, it looks so beautiful, looking at the menorah, my husband lit one, Shlemel lit one, beautiful, we see all the candles. Some of you who were driving over Glenmore 
or Fortune Street or Glenmore right next to Chabad. It's a beautiful menorah there. Hello, hello, welcome everyone else who did Malka and, and Sandy and uh, Adina and Marina. I don't know if I mentioned everybody's name, beautiful to see so many of us the last night of Hanukkah. And it's really, really nice. You drive by Glenmore, you know, next to Chabad, we put the menorah that we put there. We never had a menorah there. It's the first year. Why? Because we didn't have a big menorah to put there. Why did we put it this year? Because we couldn't put the menorah in City Hall. City Hall is closed and they didn't allow to put any, nothing there. So the big menorah that is in Heritage Park, we did it again in Heritage Park. The menorah that we have always in City Hall, we said, what should we do with it? It's a shame. So thank goodness to my husband's brain and some people that helped him. So my son Levi and I is lighting that menorah every day on her on uh, Glenmore. What did we do? It's that big metal menorah that is in that was in um, City Hall that many of you know how it looks like. We bought lanterns and we bought um, gas. I guess like you know, like when you go make a barbecue, right? You buy those green uh, containers, whatever. We bought lots of those. And that's how we lit the lanterns and it's lit really nice. And we put big projectors of light on the menorah. It's so beautiful. We have some pictures, people that were driving around. I know, I don't know if Eugenia is here already or not, but Eugenia, I don't see her yet, but Eugenia has a little Sanel as well. Eugenia sent us a beautiful picture she drove to the body. It's just nice to see. We have a lot more to cover this class, and we're going to all be, we're all so excited because the last night of Hanukkah, not because it's the last night of Hanukkah, because it's the last night of Hanukkah that's giving us so much power and so much co-op, so much strength to learn to be inspired from Hanukkah. What are we, what are we inspired from Hanukkah? One of the things are, is that Hanukkah we light, in the road Hanukkah we light at night. Right, the menorah tamikdash. When we lit the menorah in Beit Hamikdash, we saw it during the day. Hanukkah we light at night. Why? Because the candles of the Beit Hamikdash they were lit in the mikdash to give light in the Beit Hamikdash itself inside. So we lit it in the day. Because you light outside the light, it wouldn't. It, it, the place during the during the time of Beit Hamikdash. There was a lot of light, there was a lot of spirituality, everything was good. Besides the time of Hanukkah, that was a time that was very sad. So we didn't have to put light to the outside, if I may. Hanukkah, we light at night, because during the time of Hanukkah, those 200 years when the Assyrian Greeks ruled over Israel, it was a very hard time. It was very dark. It was koshech. It was dark because the Jewish people suffered a lot. And that's why when we had the miracle, we had to light, we light in the candles at night, we light the candles outside to let people know about the miracle in order to bring, to enlighten the outside, to teach, to bring purity, right? To bring salvation, to, to teach, to, to um, make the darkness into light, bring the, bring the light so when we bring us, we say, how do we fight darkness? We all know, not with rocks and not with yelling and not with screaming. We take a little match and you bring it into a dark room and all of a sudden the darkness disappears. And that is our job to do on Hanukkah. What I mentioned before, and Eugenia, you just joined us, that you sent us a beautiful picture of the menorah in um, on Glenmore Trail, right next to Chabaras. It's beautiful to drive and to see those lights, isn't it? And uh, also, and I love your, a lot of you, you know, all the back of your beautiful high school, your Hanukkah pictures. Also, the, um, the beautiful billboards, if you saw on Pathetan, many of them said, Chabad Labaj wishes you have Hanukkah, which is so, so nice, beautiful. The other thing that we wanted to mention on Hanukkah is, we know that the Jews suffered a lot then. Why did they suffer? The Greeks did not want to kill their bodies. They didn't care. It wasn't like Hitler. It wasn't like Egypt. They didn't care, uh, I'm sorry, not Egypt, like Purim, like uh, Akashverosh. During Purim, they wanted to destroy our bodies. They didn't care. You keep Torah, you don't keep Torah. You do this, you do that. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew, God forbid they wanted to kill us. 
The Greek said, no, we don't want to kill you. You can be alive as long as you don't keep the Torah. Even the Torah you can keep, but do it as a nice tradition, as, a, as something like a nice philosophy that you have. But don't make it godly. Don't make it holy. Don't connect it to God. That's why when we say the al hanisim, that blessing that we say, we don't. We say they wanted lashkicham Torah techa, everything your Torah, your mitzvot techa, your mitzvot. You want to keep Shabbat? Keep Shabbat because it's a nice thing. It's a civil thing to rest, to have one day off, one day a week off to do this. You know, just to relax and so on to be with family. It's very nice. But don't do it because Hashem created the world six days and on the seventh day you have to return connected to God. And we spoke about it many times that this is really, really, really scary to do that. Because many nations that keep things just because it's something civil and nice and, and they, don't, they, don't connect it, they don't connect nothing to God, not to godliness, they can do the worst, worst, worst things. And we know that Unfortunately, from the Halakha, from the Nazis, they were very intelligent people, very learned people. And they used their technology, their, their science, everything they had, they used. And that's why I know we have many people that were not going to buy any ovens that are made in Germany and so on and so forth. But it's scary because you think those ovens, I remember we were renovating our kitchen some years ago and we were looking at some stuff. I don't know. And one of the girls told me, one of the ladies, she tells me, you know, if you buy a German oven, you know what those ovens were used for. And it just made me shiver, you know, when she said the word oven. Yeah, they have the best ovens, but what did they do with those ovens? Because they, they weren't afraid of God. They had nothing godly. They decided that the Jewish race, God forbid, has to be nullified. And that's what the Greeks wanted to do. They were the ones that uh, invented the Olympics, right? Everything is your body. If you're strong, if a baby was born and the baby wasn't strong enough, they did not try to save the baby, let the baby die, God forbid, because they wanted just the perfect has to be. If you are strong, the Olympics, you can show your strength, that's what you can do, that's the beauty. If you are not good enough, if you're crippled, if you special need, your place is not in this world. And we know how wrong that is, because everybody's special. And who are we to decide who should live and who should not, God forbid, and what life is worth living and what life is not worth living. Every minute that Hashem is giving us life is so special. And that's what the Greek wanted to take away the neshama, the soul from us. And that's why we have a lot of emphasis on the shaman and the oil. We're gonna get soon about the shaman and the oil. So what happened during that time? The Jews really suffered. It was a very hard time. I know we speak about there was a war and this, you know, sometimes you read and you think it was something that took, you know, a few days and the whole thing was nice and dandy. They put on them a lot of terrible decrees. One of the decrees was on the Jewish girls and Jewish women that whoever got married, the Hegemon, whoever was in charge that time in the country on behalf of the Greeks, they would come and they would assault the, there was, they couldn't run away, the bride on the day of her wedding. So what happened? Jewish people stopped making weddings. Nobody wanted to get married. They would do it quietly, but if they would find out. Then there was a decree, which terrible, terrible thing, but just to think about it, God forbid, and that continues for a long time. Then they made a decree that Jews are not allowed to have a door. You can't have a door to their, to, a front door to their house. So then you have all kinds of thieves, people couldn't sleep, animals would come in. All kinds of things just to make them Israel, besides that they couldn't, you know, keep Chavez, they weren't allowed to learn Torah, they weren't, and if, and if they would find them, they would torture them. Really, really bad, terrible. And many, many people suffered, many Jews died. And here we come with the story of Yehudit. Yehudit was a very special woman she was a young woman. She was the daughter of Yochanan Kohen Gadol. And uh, she was a widow. She was a young widow. Her husband Menashe passed away. I don't know how many years after the wedding, but she was young, beautiful, and unfortunately a widow. And in the town where they lived, the Thulia, it says, they, um, the Greeks, like in every town in Israel, they wanted them to, you know, 
to convert, not to do, to start doing Torah mitzvahs, not to do what they're supposed to do. And the Jews didn't want to give in, obviously. And they made, and the Greeks couldn't get in. They were fighting really strong. They couldn't get in. So Halifornos, who was then the, the ruler, he decided that he will make a siege. He made a siege around the city. No water and no food. And he said, you know what? They will be desperate and then they will, then I'll win them. And the Greeks would come, you know, every day around the city and, and, and scream at this, and the Jews did not let them in. A time passed by, and it became very difficult, unfortunately. And uh, many people said to the leaders, let's surrender. We're going to die anyway. We're going to die from thirst, God forbid, from hunger. What should we do? So the one of the leaders said to the... Um, to the, to the town people, please let's wait a few days. Give me five days. Let's give us five days, we'll wait to see. So the people said, okay, because the, the, the people in the city didn't want to suffer anymore. They said, let's surrender. And then the ruler, the, the people from the Jewish community, right, who were in charge, they said, let's wait five days. Here comes Yehudit, a young lady, and she said, I don't understand. Why are we saying to wait five days? Why five days? What not one day, one day is what? Don't we believe that Hashem will save us? Hashem must save us. We have to find a way. We cannot surrender. Because what are they going to do to us if, if, if we're going to let them come in? They'll make us, you know, kill and whatever, rape and all the terrible, terrible things they did. And she says, we can't allow that. I have an idea what I want to do. I told them, what? I have an idea. I'm going to go to the enemy, to the camp where Holofernes was with all his army. And I, and I have a way to try to save the Jewish people, to save our place. Obviously the leaders told her, the rabbis, the, the old man told her, how can you go? Do you know what it means to go in the, to the enemy and you're a young woman and so on? And, and she was very determined. She said, well, we have to continue keeping Torah and mitzvot Please allow me. Did you remember the story with Dvorah uh, and Barak in um, the prophets? There was a lady, Yael. Uh, we're not going to go into the whole story, but basically Yael was a very special lady, and she was the one that brought victory. She was the one that killed Sitra. She killed uh, the person who was a big, big enemy to the Jewish people. And, uh, and the... The man that, that, that was fighting the war, he couldn't get to it. She, she killed him. And then that's how the whole, the whole victory came through a woman, through Yael. And she said, give me that, give me that doubt. I, I'm going to do it. Give me that uh, chance to be able to save the Jewish people the same way as Yael did. So they saw that she was so determined. They said, OK, what did she do? She obviously davened a lot because she knew, as we always speak about it, if we want to win something in this world here, we want to know, we want to do something. Obviously, we have to do it in a in a way that is, you know, we live here, we, we, we live in a in, in a physical world, so we can't just not eat and not drink and not and, and not sleep and be like angels. We have to eat, but we have to say bracha, we have to eat kosher, we have to do what Hashem wants us to do. But we know that if we want to win a war, we want to win something, we want to gain something, we want to get a good job, we have to dive and we have to ask Hashem to give it to us. If Hashem will agree to give it to us, then he'll find a way how we should get it. So obviously she prayed and said, Hashem, give me the strength to be able to help my nation. Give me the strength to be able to help my people. She dressed beautifully. She took her, um, the lady that used to help her, like her, servant lady that was with her and they dress well they put like a whale on their face you know the way they um uh dressed in she took with her old wine very yummy cheese very salty cheese and very old wine you know that when you drink you get uh, you get drunk very quickly and she walked to the place she left at night that she left the place she told the guard, I have to go. I have something special to tell the foreigners. And because she was so sure of herself, obviously with Hashem's help, she just walked through 
and the letter, she was very beautiful. And she says, I'm going, I have a message to give to your ruler and all the shows, everybody let her in. And she came in into the lion's den, you know? And here she is. And he tells her, oh, he was like shocked to see a Jewish woman come, a young Jewish lady with, with her, with the other girl that was with her. What, what do you want? Why did you come? She said, well, I have a way. She basically told him Bob and my sister, she was very brave. She said, I have a way to tell you, I can be a spy and I can tell you how you can win the city of the Jewish people that you're trying to win that whole area. I'm, I'm going to help you. He said, yeah, you sure? She said, yeah, I'll tell you what they do and so on. And then she told him, you know, you're not giving them um, food. You're not giving them water. And soon they're going to start losing it. And then they're not going to have any food. So they're going to eat you know, they're not going to eat kosher, they're going to eat stuff that they're not supposed to, and they're going to make mistakes, and then God will be angry at them, and God will be angry at them, he was not going to protect them, like, she made all kinds of things she told him, and he said, okay, and she told him, give me a few days, and I'll tell you where they're at, if they're already losing it, if they're going to surrender, what, you know, and she used to walk back and forth all the time, as though she's going to the Jewish people to get info and she wasn't really telling you anything she was just saying yeah I'm gonna get I'm gonna give you tell you more and so on and so forth amazing story that I read today you know that how that that um, time in history was the whole thing with her was uh, revealed to us later on what she had done you did the daughter of the Grand Gadol to make the long story short like after three days you started to lose it and he said okay are you gonna give me any info do you know my soldiers are really angry. They already want to go and start fighting with them and win them and, and whatever, all the terrible things that he said we want to do to them. And you're taking too long. Where, where is your info? And so on and so forth. She says, oh, I'll tell you. Tonight, I'll tell you. And he was all so um, amazed and taken over, you know, the way she spoke. She was very charming, very beautiful. She was a very kind, amazing woman. She would always help and very... Um, uh, mother, you know, ah, she, she was a righteous lady. And even he felt, you know, that beautiful thing in her and, and, and physically she was very beautiful. So she told him, oh, I'll tell you, but you know what? Before I'll tell you, I really wanted to be happy. I wanted to, uh, I brought some special food. Let's have a party first. And then, you know, and then we'll do this and this, whatever else you promised him as you can understand. So he said, okay, fine. But she said, let's first eat. And if you understand, she, you know, he ate a lot of cheese. He became very, very thirsty. And then she gave him the strong, the very strong wine. And he drank and he became drunk. And here was the moment that she waited for that Hashem should help her. You can just imagine, you know, what I'm thinking about it. When we, just going back a little bit, when we're looking at the candles, spoke about it last week. I know Rabbi spoke about it in the Tanya class last Sunday. You look into the story of the candles, you look at the Hanukkah candles, and you meditate and you think, all the brave people that were there, that so strong, many of them perished, like Anna and her seven sons, it's such a bravery story. Wow, you know, like every time I think about it, it's hard for me to speak about it, you know, I think the older I get, we get more empathy perhaps, and you think about children and how that mother was able to see what they did to our kids and how those kids were strong. And you think about all the, not the sad, all the great people. I don't look at it as, I mean, it's a sad story, but it's a story with so much strength, what they had to do the right thing. And you look at those candles and you say, God, give me the strength when I'm looking at the candles to think about the history. And one of those candles, one of those people is Yehudit. And just imagine she's standing there now in the tent of this wicked, wicked person. All the soldiers are around, are there. They allowed her to go in and out because she made that trust. They trusted that she won't do anything. And when she wanted to kill all the foreigners, that's what she came to do. She couldn't afford nobody should be there. So that's what she said. Let's have a party, just me and you. They don't want to have anybody else there. Well, he thought that she was going to give herself to him, right? The way she made it, the way she told him. So this way that nobody else should be in the tent. So it was just her and him. And here comes the moment and you think how brave she had to be to take his big sword and to do what she had to do. 
And that's how she stayed with Jewish people. It's hard for anybody to do. Anybody who's kind, anybody's a good person, especially the women. I think we're hard at time, you know, God forbid to, I don't want to say to kill someone. Here wasn't to kill him. This was to save her people, to save the Jewish people. This is something that led to victory. So she took the sword. She davened so strong to Hashem. Hashem should give her the strength, the physical strength, and the spiritual strength to do it, and she shouldn't be caught. And she put whatever in a rag, whatever his head, and she went out. And because the soldiers were so used to that she would always go in and out and she had beds with food and whatever else, nobody questioned her. And she ran as quickly as she was able to with her friend, with a maid servant, they ran. She went back to, the, to, to Israel. She went back to the place. I mean, it was also in Israel, to the city. And she told them, look, you don't have to surrender. Hashem gave us the enemy in our hands. Look what I have in my hand. And Hashem saved us and we should thank Hashem. And obviously in the morning when the people saw that the rule is not coming out of his tent, they came to see what happened. They got so scared that they saw the ruler without a head. They all ran away. The, the, the war, it was, it was a big step also to stop, the, you know, to, to end the war, to show unto Yochus that the Jewish people are strong, that they are not going to fall into the things and so on. And for sure, her town that time was saved all because of her, of Yehudit. She was so, so brave. I don't know if one of us can be so brave. I say every day in the morning prayer, we say in the morning, that don't test us. Because I can say for myself, I don't know if God brought me to such a test, I'd be able to do that. And I don't know if, if one of us, we pray to Hashem, Hashem should not bring us to such a test. But we have many, many tests that Hashem is bringing us every day that come, that we could overcome. They're not as hard as what Yehudit, the daughter of Kohen Gadol, had, as that young widow had, that beautiful lady, that special tzedeket. And look how she did, how she saved the Jewish people. Many times we have those little incidents, those little things that we can do. We have a test. Let's learn from the candles of Hanukkah. Let's overcome it. And then on those tests can be silly, but they're not silly. Somebody is mocking you. How many times we get it? We get it all the time. You know, girls, one of the first halachot in, um, in Kitzur Shulchan Aruch is um, don't be shy. Al yevosh Mal'ig is from the people who are mocking you. This is one of the hardest things. I spoke to many people. Many people will not have a large family, will not have another child, will not get pregnant again. Why? Because what will my friend say? My friend will say that I'm so old fashioned. How will I be able to support three kids or five kids or 10 kids or, or six or however many I decide if I decide to have one, how can I have another one? What will my friend say? And I have to work another job because my friend will say that my house is not as nice as hers or the car or the jewelry or... Let's think honestly in our hearts how many things we do wrong many times. We don't feel like doing it, but we are embarrassed. Oh, she will say that I'm so religious. I, I call a girl, you wanna come out with me to the restaurant? And I'll say, you know what? I don't go to restaurants or I'll go, but I'm just gonna have a drink. I'm not gonna eat. Meat, I you know I keep all the culture. How can I say it? They're all gonna laugh at me. I'm gonna lose all my friends. I know we have some girls on the chat that are amazing, but it's not easy for them because they lost many friends. Because the friends said, okay, if you're not coming with us to restaurant, then why should I call you? I, I don't feel comfortable you sitting and just drinking water and we're eating the steak or we're eating whatever that is that is not culture. Let's just eat vegetables, but some people don't want to eat just vegetables. They want to eat something that is not kosher, which is wrong. I'm just giving examples how many times we have those, you know, those tests that are really not as hard as Yehudit had. Yehudit had the face of her people in her hand. And she was so brave. She wasn't sure that she's going to be saved. She could have get there and they could, she could have been mugged and God forbid what could have happened to her and then they would have killed her and she might have not succeeded anything, but she was so sure of herself that she felt that she is going to try to save because she's so beautiful, because all the strength that she had in her, 
She said, I'm going to dive and I'm going to dive into Hashem and Hashem will help me with the plan that I'll have. With the qualities I have, I'll use it to the right things. So this is one of the, the those lessons that we learn from Hanukkah, from Yudit, how strong she was, how brave she was, and let's use it for ourselves, as I said, in our daily life. Not to, you know, not to be afraid of somebody's mocking us. We decide to do something, let's do it. In many, many ways, let's bring more light into our dark world. The other thing that I wanted to mention as well is um, Hanukkah, as we said, they didn't want to kill our body. And that's why there is no mitzvah on Hanukkah to make a meal. You know, like on Pesach, you have a whole meal, we will wash. On Purim, we have a mitzvah to do Suda, so that for him, we have to eat a meal. On Hanukkah, there is no mitzvah to eat anything specific. We eat things with, with oil, uh, fried in oil, we will discuss some white oil, but we don't have a mitzvah to make a meal, to make kiddush. What is the mitzvah? Lehodot u lehalel. We read halal, we say the al hanithim when we daven, when we bench. We praise Hashem, we thank Hashem because the whole war was a spiritual war. And that's why the way we celebrate it, right, girls, we celebrate it with spirituality. We light candles, we daven, we pray, not with food, because the war wasn't to kill our bodies. The war was, God forbid, to kill our souls, to kill our neshama. And this will bring us, as I told you last week, that today we'll learn the why. What's the special thing of the shaman, of the oil? Why do we light the candles? Why do we eat food fried in oil and so on? The shaman represents the neshama, the soul, the highest part of the soul. Why? We have different liquids that are compared to Torah. There is lechem. I mean, lechem is food, right? Bread. And the liquids are mayim. Yain and shemen, maim, water, yain, uh, wine and shemen, oil. Now in order to live, in order to be alive at least, we have to have lechem and maim, correct? Obviously we need fruits, we need protein, we need all kinds of foods, but usually want to say somebody to stay alive, and it's not a lot of nutrition, but you need water, That's bread water. and water. As we know, unfortunately, in the Holocaust, in times when people didn't have, at least if they had a little bit of water, a little, a little bit of bread, still a, a huge miracle how they survived. But this is usually when I say you have water, you have bread. So you have, you know, you can sustain yourself. This is the most essential thing that we need to provide. But this is compared to the Torah, Nigle Sheba Torah. Nigle means the revealed part of the Torah. The revealed part of the Torah that tells us do this, do this, do this, the special thing that we need in order to provide, like bread and water. Then comes yain. Yain is wine. You don't have to have wine in order to survive, but for sure, hello, but for sure wine adds more um, taste, more happiness when you have wine, right? It's, it's something we say when we celebrate, and this is alluded to the Parts of the Torah that are the secret part. Uh, uh, that explains to us a little bit why this, why that. So it makes Torah more exciting. It's not just the chat, it's not just the revealed part. Just, you know, you have to like candles and you have to make a bracha and you have to do this, but they like bread and water. But yain explains more why you say a bracha, you know, what's more in the candles, what's in Shabbat, you know, explains a little bit more. It's a little bit more exciting. What is shaman? What is oil? What is the difference between water, uh, wine, and oil and shaman? Shaman is very, very different in many ways. Water, you can drink on its own. Bread, you can eat it on its own. Um, wine, you can drink on its own. Juice, you can drink on its own. You can't drink oil on its own. Oil is not a drink. And sometimes people will drink 
cod liver oil, a teaspoon or something as a medicine, but nobody can drink oil on its own. On the other hand, all the food that we cook with, most of the food, in order to make it taste a little bit better, you need to put a little bit of oil, a little bit of butter, a little bit of margarine, right? Olive oil, healthy oils, obviously. To put oil, it makes the food much better. So, so oil is something has something very special in it. You can eat it on its own, but it enhances all the delect the delicacies that we cook, all the food that we cook, it tastes much better with oil. On the other hand, oil also does not uh, mix with anything, as we all know, right? You put oil and water, oil and, and, and wine, oil always goes to the top, always separate. You mix it a lot, a lot, but after a little while, it will separate. Oil also penetrates inside. What is it oil perish inside of us? the neshama. When we get a stain, right? Well, wine also is hard to get off. Or juice, I mean, certain stains are hard to get off. But the way the, the oil, when it gets into a piece of a garment and what it is, it's so hard to take it off. It penetrates everything very much. It doesn't, in a way, it doesn't mix with stuff. But when it goes on your clothes, when it goes in different garments, it penetrates. And that is a um, secret part of the Torah. And that's why in Hanukkah, we light with oil and we eat food fried with oil. Why? What happened in Hanukkah? As we discussed over and over, in Hanukkah, they wanted to take away the oil from us, the neshama the inner core, the stuff that penetrates inside of us, the, the, the pintaleid, the, the core of the neshama that even, God forbid, sometimes things are so difficult, like it was for Hannah with her seven sons, she still they gave away their life, all of her kids and herself in order not to bow down to the idols. As we know in many, many theories and stories that people had through the pogroms, through the Holocaust, through this, they, would have maybe saved themselves if they would say, no, I'm not Jewish, I'm not this. People would not give away the Yiddish guy because that's the inner core, this is their self. And that's what the Greeks wanted to take away from us. And Hanukkah, we celebrate that on Hanukkah. I'll explain again. On Hanukkah, we light the candles in the night because we have to bring light to the darkness. Hanukkah, we celebrate our neshama, we celebrate the mitzvahs. We don't celebrate with food, we celebrate with doing a mitzvah, with lighting oil, with praising Hashem. And that represents the inner part of the Torah. Not just the secret, the inner part, the Kabbalah, the hidden, hidden part. Why? During the time of Hanukkah, it was the dark part. During that time, it was a dark part in the Jewish people. In order for us to get out from the dark, we needed a lot of light. And that's why we need the parts of the Torah that are hidden that nobody knew because we need a lot of strength. We need something that will penetrate us like the oil. And this is what Hasidus is. This is what Kabbalah is. This is what the Zohar is. This is what we're learning. As we learned as well, when it was the 19th of Kisa before Hanukkah, when the Alter Rebbe, uh, the 1700 when he started revealing Siddhis, when he wrote the book of Tanya, there was a lot of opposition, not only in this world from religious Jews, but the reason those religious Jews were against it, also because there was a position up there in heaven. The angel said to Hashem, how can you reveal the inner parts of the Torah that only Yechideis Gula, Yechideis Gula means very few Special people, Yechidei Gula, it refers to like the, the you know, um, the apple of your eye, like, you know, the something the very special, very few rabbis would know it, very special few people were able to learn, to understand, to comprehend it. And now you're bringing it down to every Jew, to every person, to every simple person that doesn't know much of Torah, they are able to learn it. There was a lot of opposition before nobody was able to know it. And that's what the rabbi is saying. Yes, we needed that in order to be able to get out of the darkness. 
the more dark it is, we need more strength to get out from it. Mm -hmm. And that's why we fry lactose in oil, we eat so ganyoti plus what it's not a mitzvah to eat lactose. It's not a mitzvah to eat sulganyot. It's a mitzvah to light candles. It, it's a custom to eat that stuff just because it reminds of us of the miracle of oil. It reminds us that oil has special significance. It always goes on top. It doesn't mix with anyone else, with anything else. It enhances everything. Let's take all those examples to our neshama that we always have to know. Yeah, this is good, this is good, but the certain things I don't mix with other people. I don't do certain things, you know? Many people would ask about marriage and I'm not trying to actually put anybody down or anything like that. And a lot of things happen and, and things happen and people make choices sometimes, not the right choices. But we do know that when it comes to marriage, we have to marry Jewish. And many times young people say, well, what's the difference? They're very nice people. Who says they're not nice people? Not Yiddish people are wonderful people. Hashem created lots of people in the world and they're wonderful. And not everybody has to be Jewish. That's not what it, what, what it was meant to be. Not everybody has to be a Yid. Hashem did not want everybody to be a Yid. We have this nation, this nation, they're all nice. We all have to be just. We all have to be nice. We all have to be courteous. We have to respect each other. But certain things we don't need when it comes to marriage, when it comes to this. Certain things we know we can do, so this we don't. We know if we are married, then we're married. We don't mix. We don't decide, okay, well, today I feel like I'm sorry. to tell, I feel like sleeping with somebody else. I'm tired of my wife. I'm tired of my husband. Why not? It's a free world. I can do what I want. So there's certain things that we don't do, right? So you can say, well, I, I'm not modern. I want to today go with another guy. Same thing as you don't say that this is not the wrong thing to do. The same thing, yeah, you cannot. The Torah says we have to marry Jewish. The certain things we meet, certain things we don't. Not because we are putting somebody down, because this is the way things go. I have the $10. This is my $10. This is what I buy. I tell my child, you can't. Well, my friend has $20. Can't I take a dollar? He won't even know. No, this means stealing. You cannot take something that doesn't belong to you. Why not? You cannot mix. This is what the oil teaches us. Certain, the oil doesn't mix with other things. We have to know that certain things are only ours and we have to cherish it and we have to keep it, whether it's family, our Yiddish guide, our Torah. And on the other hand, we have to be light to the nation. Like oil, when you light the oil, the, the, when you ignite the oil, right? It puts a lot of light. Let's look at the Hanukkah candles and say, where else can we bring light? Who else can we ignite with the light of Torah to bring them love, to bring them light, to bring them hope, to help? Who else can I help with the light of Hanukkah, which is the light of hope, the light of Torah, the light of love, the light of against oppression, against, you know, have freedom of speech, all the things that are the right things to do, this is what light is, and that's what Shemin represents. And the, the the reason, as I said, we speak so much about it on, on, on Hanukkah is because Hanukkah is a yontav that we have to do to make the, the outside dark. That's the only yontav, the only hug that we do Pirsume Nisa that we have to publicize the miracle. That's why we make billboards, says Hanukkah Sameh, with, you know, on, on, on lights, we have on big streets, the menorahs, because menorah is a symbol of light of freedom of expression, freedom of religion, to make sure that everybody everybody should do what they have to do, what the right thing to do, not oppress anyone, to do the right thing, and to bring the light to ourselves. Now, because, uh, and Sanuka was created, if I may, during the Lul, it, it, it's not a, it's not a it, it was during the time of Beit HaMikdash, but it's not a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah that are it's not a mitzvah that is written in the Torah. Um, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, Sukkot is in the five books of the Torah. Purim and Hanukkah came later on, right? It came later on when the Jewish people were in the desert. When the Jewish people went, left the desert when they were in Israel. The five books of the Torah is only till Moshe Rabbeinu passed away. It was when the Jewish people were in the desert in the 40 years. It came later on. It had such a strong, strong mitzvah still to do it, even though it's a mitzvah that came later. 
And this is one of the mitzvot that are never going to be nullified. There is a, a thing in the Torah that when Moshiach will come, God willing, very soon, some mitzvot are not going to be as important anymore. Some holidays we're not going to keep. I don't know if we're still going to have to do, you know, I don't know exactly what will be with Sukkot, with Pesach, but there's a lot of uh, uh, opinions. It says that Nerot Hanukkah, the candles of Hanukkah, and Nam Betelim Le'olam, it will never be nullified. The candles of Hanukkah will always be there. Right? Because Hanukkah is such a strong message. Hanukkah is the candles of the redemption. The shaman, the oil, as we said, it represents Kabbalah. It represents the hidden part of the Torah. When will we know the hidden part of the Torah? 100%, 100% revealed when Moshiach will come. It will be with the coming of Moshiach. Now we have a taste for it. We have a little taste for it. And as I said, we learn it every time when we learn the, about the Parsha, about Hanukkah, about whatever we learn. We always have to reshim, we always have explanations of Kabbalah on it. And that explains the beauty, and that's why it's easier to keep. And we have to know it, as we said, when there is more darkness, you have to bring more light and more light. As if you have a child, we know a child in school, we have students. If we have a child that's very rebellious for some reason, then you have to understand why. Maybe he's going through a hard time at home. Maybe there's something inside. Maybe the child is very brilliant and you are not giving enough stimulation to the child so they become rebellious. They don't know what to do with themselves. So you have to be more creative. You have to explain, you have to be more creative, you have to give more love in order for the child to bloom. And then the child will know so much. That's exactly what oil is. That's exactly what Kabbalah is. We now explain it's not enough now for our youth, for our generation, it's important for us to know. Even ourselves, when we were children, when we were, uh, you know, we're not that old, but when we were teenagers, many things, and I'm sure you would, agree with me. I know I was that way. You know, my parents told me that's what you do. That's many things I didn't feel like doing, but I still did. Like who is telling the parent no? Who is arguing? Well, I don't want it, but I don't want. I'm too tired. I'm not going to do it. I didn't have the, the, never mind the hood for the thing to say. If my mother asked something, obviously I do it. It's hard. I mean, I might show a sour face. I might not be excited, but there was no way that I will not do it. Not because I was afraid, just that's the way we were. And I'm sure many of you will agree with me now. Even young children, I don't feel like doing, I don't want to do it, mom, and this, and or mom, or dad, and you know, and arguing, and this, and so on, so we can get angry, but we can't. We, it's a different generation, we have to explain. Like Hasidus, somebody says, well, I don't want to keep Travis. I don't understand. Hasidus comes, Kabbalah comes and explains, how beautiful, what happens in the 26 hours when we keep Shabbos, the holiness that comes and the angels and, and how we have to use that day. And all of a sudden we're learning that that day means so much, not just don't, don't drive, don't cook, don't watch TV, don't speak on the phone. That's not what Shabbos is. That's how it was years ago. Perhaps many people looked at it that way. And that's why many people stopped keeping Travis because they don't want to, they don't want to hear, don't, don't, don't. They, they want to do whatever they want. They don't want nobody to tell them what they can do, what they can't do. But come see this, come the oil of the Torah, the hidden part, and you say, you know what? You know what Shabbos means? The seventh day, you know what number seven is? You know when Shabbos comes, we have an extra neshama, we have neshama yetera, extra neshama. There's a special holy, another neshama that comes, that's what we have so much more, many people love, that's why you eat so much on Shabbos, because you have two souls, <laughs> you eat too much, but the Neshama, I mean, that's in a, in a jokey way, obviously, but we have an extra Neshama because we have the ability to have so much more um, godliness, so much more pureness. If we want, we have to dig to it, we can get it. We, If we don't look at it, we won't see it. It's the same thing as you can get a gift, right? And if you don't know you have it, Somebody brought you a beautiful jewelry, a box, and it's laying in your room, it's laying in your purse, you didn't open it, you don't even know you have it, you're not excited because you don't know you have the gift, you didn't open it, you didn't unwrap it. We're all getting the special second neshama, special pure neshama on Shabbos for those 26 hours in order to purify ourselves, 
in order to learn better, in order to dive in better. If we tap into it, we will feel it. If we don't, it stays concealed, closed, and nobody knows. And now that we know we have it, we can use. So when you come to a Jewish man, to a Jewish lady, and you, you read and you explain what Shabbos means, what happens when you light the candles, you say the bracha, and you look at it, and you look at the beautiful light, the beautiful flickering, two candles, 10, 20, and you think about the light in your life, and you think what you want to bring, and you become more excited and more calm, and all the good things you want to do, you feel like doing Kiddush. You feel like taking the Siddur and singing Lechadu Dili Krat Kala. Such a beautiful prayer, all about feminism, right? All about Jewish women. I just look at the clock. Lechadu Dili Krat Kala, Kala the bride, because Shabbat is the feminine, and we learn everything, what it means, what, what this femininity means in Hashem, what Shabbos means, and so on. So all of a sudden, you look at Shabbos. When I look at Shabbos, I don't look at it as, oh, not to cook, not to speak on the phone, not to this. For me, Shabbos is not, not don't. For me, Shabbos is, yes, I have time to meditate. I have time to be with the family. I have time to do what I really want to do. To sing, yeah, I do. I we have to work six days in order to have Shabbat. We can't have Shabbat six days and one day work. We have to. But when you work the six days and you have a good Shabbat, so then the six days are good, right? The Shabbat blesses the six days. The Shabbat, and, and you get all that energy to be able to withstand the hard six days of the week that we work and so on. I have time to spend with the family, with myself first. To think, what am I doing in this world? Work, 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 and then what? Yeah, I work for a reason. So this week I'll help this, this charity. I'll call this friend. I'll cook this for my family because I know they like it. I'll do this. I'll become better with speaking less gossip on the phone. I will spend my time, less time on TV, less time on WhatsApp reading silly messages. I'll read the messages that I have. There are Torah messages. I'm trying to give all kinds of examples that I'm telling myself. I have in a day 24 hours. I wish I would sleep six of them. I mean, I'm telling myself I sleep very little. Not good, but I'm trying to train myself to sleep more, just not enough time in the day. And then the time that I do have. So one hour pass. What did I do? Right? You go to sleep at night and you say Shema. And you say, I forgive everybody for everything that, that they did wrong to me, I, I want to go to sleep without any grudges, you say Shema, and you think, what did I accomplish? It's hard for us to think about it every day. And we have one day with Shabbos, that we, we can really meditate, we can really think of our lives, what did I do last week, how did the week go, what I want to do this week, I have time to read, not silly novels, read some Jewish history, read some Jewish books, explanation of Torah, something that will enlighten me, something that will make me happy. Something will make my knowledge rich in Jewish teaching. Something will make me proud to be a Jewish woman, to be a Jewish person, to be thankful to Hashem created me who I am. And now you see girls, all of a sudden Shabbos, it's completely a different day. It's not don't, 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 it's yes, yes, yes. And I think, well, it's not enough time in the day. Like, you know, when we had Shabbatons in camp, and we had also the Smitsu Club, like teenagers. Um, My no, I, this was the whole Shabbos. So I remember it, it, in the after Shabbos or before, many times it was after Shabbos, the children would tell me, the boys, the girls, whatever they were, they said, Miss Matosov, we were so nervous. We knew that we can't use the phone for 24 hours, 26 hours. I didn't know how will I manage without texting, without Facebook, you know, but they knew they were in my house, obviously. Nobody's gonna have the phone. And they said, you know what? I can't believe it. The Shabbos went by. And I didn't even think about my phone. I said, because you were so busy with things that are above a phone. You were so enlightened. You had a lot of games, you had stories. You spent quality time with your inner soul, with your chairman, with your oil, with your with your core of your neshama, you didn't need those external things to make you happy. Those things that make you happy. It's like my husband likes to bring that example a lot of times. When the baby is crying, the child is hungry. The child says, I want a candy, I want a candy. <clears throat> the child does not necessarily, maybe he wants the candy. He doesn't need the candy. He needs 
bread, you need chicken, you need fruit, you need milk, you need, you need some kind of nutritious food to eat. You're giving food, you want to ask for the candy. The, you know? What's going the, on? The, 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 yeah, we have a little bit of noise. Maybe somebody wants to somebody wants to mute themselves. Sorry, maybe they think it's somebody called Oh here. my gosh. And somebody called Schneer Schneer. Yeah. yeah. Somebody yeah. wants to mute themselves. Yeah. Okay. But when we are when you doesn't know what to do with themselves, they go to the phone, they run to this, they run to this, they don't have something else in their life. If they know that they have something meaningful, they're gonna do that. I want to share with you a short story we're gonna be finishing here about Hanukkah and others so much what to discuss, but <clears throat> about my son of Remy. He called me last week just to make the long story short. Sunday. Last week was the Shabbos of Hanukkah, right? I don't know if I shared it with anybody yet. Anyway, he says, Mommy, we had a, I had an adventure last week. I understood right away that something was wrong, but I'm speaking to him. He's okay. I was happy. I said, you're okay? He says, yeah, I'm okay. Anyway, Friday afternoon, the, he goes to school in Paris, in, in France, in Paris, but he doesn't live in Paris. He lives in Brunois, it's a suburb of Paris. But on Friday, they go to downtown Paris to put fill in on people, to ask who wants to go on film, uh, bring the road, now it's Hanukkah. For a while, there was a lockdown, so they couldn't go anywhere in Paris. But now, thank goodness, things are better. So they're allowed to go. And obviously, they have gloves. They offer people whoever wants, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And they were giving the road and Shabbat candles and Hanukkah menorahs to people whoever wanted. Um, and I asked him, you speak French? I said, yeah, I know enough to ask you, are you Jewish? I say, they asked me why, and I say, because it's Hanukkah, and uh, okay, and then they say, oh, I'm not Jewish, I want a menorah, I do want it, so on and so forth. Anyway, they rush in to go back, it's short Fridays, they take the wrong train, he was with his American friends, you know, but he realized that the names of the trains are not the same. You're right, you have to two stops. They got off, they went to take the other train. They realized they were going the wrong direction. They took the other train. And um, as they want to take the train, the, the door closed because there were too many people on the train. And you know, when you have to get home for Shabbos and it's Friday afternoon, every minute counts because Shabbos is Shabbos. And you're talking about 17 year old boys, Baruch Hashem. So, and I'm, I'm saying it's, it's, it's so amazing because teenagers, how many teenagers nowadays at the age of 16, 17, 18 really care enough to, to rush for Shabbos for this, that it's important enough for them and which things occupy his mind, his phone, his silly Facebook and all those Instagram and all the little silly things or he's learning, he knows what he has supposed to do and so on and so forth. It was amazing, you know, when I was speaking to him. And then he tells me, um, so I said, whatever he said, mommy, I had my phone, thank God. He right away called uh, one of the older mentors, whatever, in Yeshiva, and he says, we're gonna be a little bit late. Maybe you can send somebody to the train station to get us because by the time we're gonna walk, it's gonna be late. The guy sent the car, everything was okay, but the train closed and I don't wanna keep you long, but everything somehow had to go wrong. And it's already very close to Shabbos and they are still standing on the train station and trying to find the train that they were supposed to now because that one didn't let them on. And all of a sudden a Jewish man walks, to, walks into them and he saw two Jewish boys. He was a French man, but he spoke Hebrew and um, English. So he told them, where do you want to go? He told him to go. And then my son told him, he says, you know, we would never meet you here. Because at this point, at this time, it would be already in Yeshiva because I have to light the menorah. And it's getting very close to Shabbos. But for some reason, whatever happened, the door closed, we took the wrong train and so on and so forth. Would you mind to put on film? He said, yeah, he was in the hospital and he didn't have a chance to put on film. So my son said, please put on film because, you know, there's a reason we met anyway. He said, yeah, he um, agreed. He put on film. He told them where to go. And the guy, the, um, the mentor that uh, the older boy told him that the a Mr. Tank, you know, the look of motorhomes um, that, that people go on to put fill and so on, that the Mr. Mr. Tank would come and wait on this and the year, or whatever, on that um, city close to the place where you have to go, they will come and get you and put your stuff there. And then you guys are gonna walk to Yeshiva. It's about 15 minute walk from that straight station to the place or to the suburb where you have to go. 
And my son was calling to tell him, but somehow they gave him the number didn't connect. The guy waited there. And by the time they got there, it was two minutes already before Shabbos. Uh, the guy that was there with his van, they saw his van, they saw the Mr. thing, but Mr. thing was already locked. He locked it, put the keys, I guess, under the car. They didn't know where to find it, and he left. And now he tells me, Mommy was standing there. It's dark, it's getting dark, it's raining. It was cold last week there. And we didn't know what to do. We have our tefillin. They have a pet tefillin, not a brand, is the other guy. And we had, I had my phone and I had money in my pockets and in my coat. I didn't know what to do. So he said, I took off my coat and we put the stuff in the bag and we shoved it under the car. I said, why didn't you empty your pockets and you stayed with your coat? You were cold. He says, mommy, do you understand? It was two minutes to Shabbos. What was more important? I should be cold or I should keep Shabbos. And I said, you're right. Because if I had to make that choice, that's what I do as well. He says, he just took up his coat, threw it under. So God forbid he shouldn't desecrate Shabbos by carrying anything in his pocket. So they put the coat under the, the car and they started walking. They, I didn't know. He didn't tell me how long he walked. He said, mommy, it was much longer than 15 minutes because he didn't know exactly. So I don't know if they walked an hour or two hours. I don't know how long they walked. But they got to Yeshiva. Then he told me something so interesting that taught me. I know it's beginning a little bit late. But it shows the strength of the Torah, the strength of halacha. If our sages wrote something in halacha to do, many times we say, oh, it seems so, I don't like to use the word steal, or we don't understand why there is such halacha to do this, or why the sages, the halacha that the sages wrote, they did not come up with it with their own mind. It's all godly. There is a halacha that if you leave feeling in a place that is not secure, makom lo shamur, like in a healthy place, and it's Shabbos, you're not allowed to carry. So what do you do? You're allowed to put it on you. Although on Shabbos, you're not allowed to touch film. But if it's such a situation, you have to put it on you, and you have to walk to the closest house or whatever, to your house, whatever, and take it off. And you don't have a problem, but you... So when they got there, I guess that they told the other guys, we left the film, and they were rushing, so... My son said he didn't go, but his friend went with someone else because it was his friend's film. He went, he put on the film on him, on his head, on his hand, and he walked back. But obviously the coat and the bag and the money, everything stayed there under the car. But I guess because it was late at night, and it was black, they probably didn't realize. He said, mommy, I guess we could have pushed it really under. He said, it's a motor home. It's very big. Nobody would find it. But anyway, he said when they came Saturday night, to take his stuff. There was just one bag left there that had meaningless stuff, but the coat was taken, the, the film covers were taken, the money was taken. Papora, you know, what can you do? Uh, a friend will give him a, a coat and whatever, we'll have to buy him a new coat, <laughs> doesn't matter. So he said, mommy, but I'm okay. I said, that's right. You're great, you're okay, Baruch Hashem. Why am I sharing the story? You know, like I heard it first, I was like, I was so, grateful that he was okay. He said there was no danger in it. Everything was okay. We just, you know, it happened. It was late. And thank God that we were able to keep Chavez. He couldn't light the menorah though. It bothered him. He told me that I called my friend. They called and they said, I have my menorah in my room. Please light the menorah for me because by the time I'll come, it will be Shabbos and I won't be able to light the menorah. So they lit the menorah for him. You know, they lit the menorah for them. But he was so happy that he was able to keep Chavez, he didn't have a problem. And thank goodness he did not stay somewhere in the middle of nowhere and they were able to walk. So they walked an hour instead of 50 minutes, fine, but they still, they were safe and everything was okay. And I was saying from it that, you know, after I hung up the phone and so on, I was a little bit like taking back. I was so grateful that he was safe and everything was okay. But I said, Baruch Hashem, how many people would be so proud that the 17 year old boys or girls would be so careful and so excited to keep a mitzvah and not to be afraid to be cold and to leave the coat. I mean, you don't have to, but obviously he had no choice because he said, mommy had too many things in there. It was very late. It was a, you know, you can imagine you can lose yourself and you left it. You didn't think obviously it will disappear. It was dark. Maybe when the, when the guy came at night to take out the feeling, he didn't realize that he didn't pack it 
inside. Maybe somebody was hiding somewhere in the car and they saw people shoving something under the car and the minute they left with this feeling, they want to get it. I don't know. Anyway, Baruch Hashem was okay. But I was so proud that he was so proud of himself that he did everything correctly, that he took the right train. And he called his, the guy that, to help them and he used his phone and, and the one safe. He did everything, the right protocol, as we say, that he had to do. And Baruch Hashem, I told him, Baruch Hashem, you're safe. And Baruch Hashem, you didn't have the test, God forbid, to desecrate Shabbos even for a minute. And I was so proud that his shaman, that his oil and his neshama was strong and he knew what is right and what is wrong. And with this, we'll end the class that we should have the strength from tonight's eighth candle. This is the fullest light of the menorah. And the menorah is the inspiration we have to take from the menorah for the whole year. The, the same way as Hanukkah, the first night is one candle, then it's two, then it's three, right? The second one, then it's four. We add in light, we add like, not like Shammai, like Bet Hillel. Every day we add one more candle. Now that we finish the eight, right? We have to add more. We have to learn from it that in our lives, every day has to be better than the day before. Whatever I did yesterday was amazing. I achieved so much, but tomorrow I have to achieve more. I have to achieve more two days later. And that's the only way we become better and better people because humans, we cannot be in one place. We either go up or go down. If we don't go up, we go down. We don't stay status quo ever. If you say, well, I earned enough, and I'm not, if you're not going to go to work, you're not going to make money. So either the stock market will go up or will go down, like something is going to go there. If you want to gain weight, you want to lose weight, you know what I'm trying to say in everything in life. If you don't study, then you forget. So we don't stay like this. We go either up or down. And that's what we want to do with Hanukkah. We want to go up and up and up, like the shaman, like we like the light of the oil in order to make the darkness light. Remember, oil always goes on top. It doesn't um, mix with other liquid. So the certain things by us in life that we know it's sacred, like the candles of the menorah, like the candles of Hanukkah. And they wrote halalu kodesh hem. Kodesh, they're holy. We cannot use them. Therefore, we have the shamash. When we light the Hanukkah candles, we have to have light in the room because we cannot use the light. We cannot use the light of the of the candles of Hanukkah, because they're sacred. So our neshamas are sacred. Certain things in our Jewish life is just for us, but many things like the oil is at taste, right? In every food. So we have to share, we have to know what we have to do. It has to penetrate us, just like the oil makes us stain, it stays forever. Everything we learn to understand, to do more. And we should have a wonderful Shabbat is the Shabbat after Hanukkah. It's not Shabbat Hanukkah, but Hanukkah is still on tonight and tomorrow. Still we light candles. Let's light the candles. Let's look at Shabbat. Use the second Shoma that we have with a lot of love, with a lot of happiness, with a lot of holiness. To look at Shabbat, not don't, 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 but yes, yes, yes. What can I do? How can I embrace the light of Shabbat, the holiness of Shabbat, that it should last, it should give me that serenity for the six days to come till next Shabbos. Have a good Shabbos. I'm sorry that I'm a little bit late. Sorry with the story. I hope you like to hear Avrami's story. Baruch Hashem was all good, but just, it was amazing. Like it's amazing for me to see that he didn't lose it. He knew what he was doing. He kept focus. He was safe. He had this. And anyway, we got a Bible and a phone and a little cell. But what is that? What's important is in your mind. Yeah, you lose a cell. How many teenagers pass those cells every day? Not because they kept it somewhere that they did that because they wanted to keep Shabbos, because they were many times just, you know, negligent, right? Here, he didn't lose it, whatever. It was stolen because of, it was an idea. There was a reason why it was left. It was not enough time, you know, and so on. So I told him that. I said, you should be proud of yourself and, uh, and obviously be safe. And they are, they are safe there. <laughs> on your Shabbos. and thank you to all of you who sent me such beautiful birthday wishes I didn't have a chance to call everybody back some people send in a whatsapp so I answered thank you and we should only celebrate Simchas 
And uh, I don't know if somebody wants to share something. I know we're going a little bit. I quick. have a poem for just my Rebbitson. I know that it, I miss the beginning of the, I miss the beginning and I want to share this with everyone. The, this is in honor of your recent birthday on the fourth candle. The light of Hanukkah shines through your life. God's gifts so adorn you as rabbits and wife, as mother, as safta, as woman of valor, your constant devotion to all things that matter. Sharing your learning, your faith in true Torah, no doubt, no doubt God had planned this fourth candle menorah. Your beauty within glows with beauty without. Your constant commitment to family, the rabbi, community, world, guiding with chokhmah, with chesed, and all that keep feminine conversations unfurled. A freilichen Geburtstück, Taira Rochele, Taira Rebetzen. So no schöpfen naches, von Familie und Freund, von sich allein euchet, wo Gottes Liebe scheint, in deine bräune Eugen, also wie in Gottes Welt, was ihr begreift täglich, die Kehille doch Welt. Bleib gebenscht und zufrieden mit alles, was ist treu, für alle liebliche Teile, Führerin, Freude, a Führerin, was leicht Ihr Leben mit Gott in jedem Sies Atem und in jeder Trott. A freundlichen Geburtstag bis 120 mit Liebe von mein Herz zu deins, mit Liebe von mein Herz zu alle Dorheim. Amen. What a beautiful Yiddish. Thank you. I'm very honored. Wow, that's so special. Wow, that's so nice. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Very nice. Uh, all all those menorahs in your backgrounds. All oh, nice. Thank you again, Sharon, for sponsoring our class. And um, we should all have that beautiful strength to continue the light of Hanukkah, to look at those candles and to add a lot of light throughout and to learn the inner part of the Torah, which we are learning. The Tanya classes on Sunday with Rabbi Marasov, I know. Some of you are attending is amazing, you know, to it helps so much, doesn't it? When you learn the inner parts and you know why you do things, so much harder to not to do them. It, well, it feels so much harder, but it's so much easier to do them. We want to do them. We always have to do positive, right? Only positive. <laughs> we still have the, the old uh, school, you know, the negativity. Now it's got to be all positive. The Reb always says, only positive. You tell children, only in a positive way, you know, the, the threatening doesn't help. And we shouldn't, because we're coming to the time of Mashiach. Mashiach, everything will be positive and good. So that's how we get uh, close to it. And we should remember the bravery of Yehudit and all the special things we learn. Boy, a lot of stuff to learn, isn't it? Good night, good Shabbos. Shabbos. And um, I don't know what else to say. Mm -hmm. We'll again next Thursday. Next Mirch. Thursday, good will and yeah, girls. We don't always send emails. We try, but it's always the same. It's the same uh, Zoom, so you can just uh, go on it and do it. And thank you all for uh, all of you who helped us deliver so many boxes to so many families. The, the notes that we're still getting are wonderful, and how many people were so happy. This lady, she didn't have a chance to go buy candles. They moved, and she didn't know to buy candles. And that day the blue box I brought to her house. Somebody else wrote that they couldn't go out because of the lockdown, because they're afraid to go out. Or or it's just nice to, as many people said, even though they had candles, they had menorah, right? It's just nice to know that somebody's thinking of you. And somebody took the time, so many of you drove hours, hours, hours to bring to this. And some girls here called me, I don't know if you have this address to this person. Maybe you don't know how to this person. And, you know, people really care to go and bring. And today a friend of mine called me from Israel. She has a cousin in Edmonton, but she's on our mailing list because she has her first cousin. She wanted us to be in touch with her. So we mailed it to her. And she told her, she told my friend in Israel, my friend Cole, she said how special it was. She didn't think to light candles and then she got into her house, you know, a little bit uh, not very strong with Yiddish, unfortunately, that family. 
But since she got it, she, she felt so special. She felt like she has to do it now that the candles came to her house. <laughs> Not by choice, you know. So she decided to do it, which is great. Which is great. So many people who didn't hear in years all of a sudden, you know. And we got many phone calls also. I don't know if I mentioned to you. Many people called us, oh, can you please deliver to my mother, to my brother, to this, you know, like from different provinces, people called us. Somehow everybody heard that we were doing it. So Baruch Hashem. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for helping us help the community. And we should always continue to give light. And thank you again for the beautiful poem in Hebrew. I mean, in English and in Yiddish. So, so sure. Good night, good night, good Shabbos, and we'll, uh, if somebody has some question, you can ask, otherwise I think we'll call it tonight. <laughs> and I hope everybody's feeling well. I know somebody's, I wasn't feeling well, somebody did, hope everybody should be well, and uh, good night, good Shabbos. Thank you, thank you. That's right. Thank you. Hilda, thank you. So beautiful. Thank you. Zashena Medish, Zashena. Zashena, thank you. Now, we have a whole whole bunch. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yiddish. The Rebbe's best, yeah? Do you know Yiddish? We have a whole bunch of time to teach Yiddish to English. Oh, that's not true. That's a whole bunch. Because it's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening in Hawaii. No, it's not. In the Temple of Manuel. What did you say? You know, the song, beautiful, beautiful Hanukkah, Rabbi Aronovich and everything. What a Hanukkah Zoom. And by the end, I, I took, they need a tribute, so I'll be home for Christmas. And uh, and they sang me, uh, I'll be home for Christmas. And... Uh, and um, what is it? A white Christmas? That's the deal. With them, they close the Hanukkah. Does it know? A bunch of going. Anyway, all the best. Shabbat Shalom. You too, Fanny. Thank you. You know, I had a busy day today. I'm tired. Well, you had a very, you had a Zoom call at 3.30. Os gesucht and os gemacht latkes and bis gemen pas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been a fat tumult. I've been a fat tumult. Oh yeah, I love the holiday of Hanukkah so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Myself, they're all beautiful. I thank you, God, all the Yom Toivim. But Zin Kin Weisun Hanukkah. The mice of... Yeah, if they gave it a bite and clean it, they yelled, look, you can't get a gosh. And the two, you can't get a gosh. And the two, you can't get a gosh. Oh, my God. My Baba Flick machen a seiden... I hope you got a zekel, you can't get from house. And a seiden zekel, you can't get it with a... With a string, yeah. But from side... Yeah, yeah. A seiden klein zekel, in a baitala, a baitala. A baitala, a kleins. In, when I've been given a kin, I've been given a kin, the silver dollar. So it's given... Oh, this is a sag. This is given inflation. This is a sag, yeah. You can get a grosh. Two to two grosh. Now, the two of them get clinged to me. So see it, but I have to get a guy to get clinged. I have geld. Anyway, I'm going to go to bed. Would you believe it? I'm so tired. It's a bit, it's a busy day. I exercised very, you know, for an hour. I do it every morning. Do you? Do you do it in the after you have breakfast? Before you have breakfast? No, before. I not after breakfast. No. What do you do? do? You go on the treadmill. Do you do? Um, no, 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 no treadmill. Sir. No, we do. We do an hour. It's. Um, a cardio, like a little bit aerobics, and then weights, yeah. and then we do um, uh, with elastic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's That's strength, wonderful. balance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's wonderful. So, it's wonderful, Fanny. Yeah. Yeah. I do it on Zoom. Yeah. On Zoom? Oh, like from the center? From the center. And when I don't like the class, I go on YouTube. YouTube is beautiful, lovely classes. 
all kind. I yes. put on 70 now because the 80, the, 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 the 85 and 90 are too easy for me. So I don't get benefits from that. What's that about 75? I've got 70, you know, on YouTube. It's called, it's, it, what's 70? No, it's, it's, no, no. And you go on YouTube, seniors, oh. seniors, exercise. So I choose 17 up. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. I used to teach yoga to seniors. Children to seniors was what I did. I like uh, yoga and qigong because I find it very, very relaxing and very... I don't like yoga. It's too slow for me. No, I need something fast. It's how you it's how you teach it. It's how you teach it. Look, I I love I love aerobics. They're, you know, you know, and I love weights. And weights. There's one class sometimes I take and she's got only weights. It's very you know. How many pounds do you lift? Like five, five. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah, five pounds. Yeah. It's important. Mm -hmm. It's important. It's important to stay. Weights is for the bones, definitely. Shouldn't get those did, you know, did you know Zohar? Oh sure. Zohar, um, not Zohar, who had I think a, his wife is Sasha. Not no, Zohar, not no, Zohar, whose wife is the redhead. This is Zohar. He was an Israeli fellow, I believe. Then I don't know. And his wife was 65. I don't know how old. I don't know. I don't know. He passed away a couple of months ago, and he had a big company, a very big company. Then to I don't know. The Met. And um, she lives in the country. She's very, very lonely. The young mm -hmm. woman. I didn't know if you knew him, Zohar. No, no. No. We're they're in the country. They're just over by, apparently, I haven't been to their home, but they lived, um, they lived by the Springbank Airport on an acreage. Yeah. On an acreage. She was, I think, originally maybe Russian. Very attractive blonde woman. Didn't know. So what happened? She died? He he passed he away. Died. He had an aneurysm two months ago. Oh my god. But I I didn't know I didn't know uh, that you didn't know him. No. But, uh, no. The Rebbitson, you know what? The one thing that I find, I mm. like you said, I love the things I like when I listen, it reminds me of looking at in this class looking at all of the people and i think the matters of family is still on but i was thinking of looking at all of the people who um uh, who don't know about uh shabbos when i listen to what she no but when she when she speaks about Shabbos the way she does, it yeah. reminds me of how when I was a child growing up and we didn't watch the TV and I didn't play the piano, yeah. no, no. piano things, that I really, <coughs> I really think that when she uses the word meditation, she doesn't meditate, she reflects. Meditation is very different than reflecting on how I'm doing and what's going on. Meditation is not that. Meditation is quieting yourself. Meditations, they're Hebrew meditations, but the reflecting, you know, the truth is, I remember on a Shabbos when there wasn't that much to do, you did get a chance to absorb being present. You were, you know, today they go to courses all over the world on mindfulness, on being present. The one thing that I felt about Shabbos, when Freitag is gekommen and what on gezinnt in the Licht and what gehad betschere, the ganze Welt hat sich geändert. It had such a peaceful, a peaceful atmosphere. So we had the Shechina, like the Shechina came over the, the, the town. I remember my town courts. It's like the Shechina. And Shabbos, 
Dat is Shabbos. Oi, de Chale, Freitag, in de Kichlach. Wie Shabbos doch bitte? Die Kieber Shabbos doch bitte, wo sie sich nicht gewollt haben. Wo sie gewollt haben, so schnell nach der Nacht wetschere, wo sie schnell nach der Nacht wetschere, wo sie schnell nach der Nacht wetschere. Wow. Wo sie nicht gewollt haben. 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 You know, but that I remember as a child when the Russian came yeah. and Shabbos, I was going to school. No, I was going to but I was going to go to school. And I was going to go to Shabbos. Shabbos schreibt me not. Oh, I was going to go to the teacher, in alles, I was going schreiben. Ich habe geschrieben, und nachher habe ich selbst so tapp, es wäre auf meine Hand. Wie ein Kind, you know? Because ja. man sagt, nicht sie gewähnt, als ja. Schabes schreibt man nicht. Ja, mir reicht es, wenn er so in meinem Stieb. Ich habe Kemel nicht geschrieben. Auf und nach, nach, ich habe mich schreiben, you know? Sie gehen mit den Russen, und so on. So bin ich gegangen in, in, in der Schule, und ich habe gedacht, ich habe you know? Ich bin gegangen, ich habe es in Sintig, was auch. We were going six days a week. Right. You know, and That we went. Six days know. a week. Wow. But we learned, we learned, learned. But we learned, we learned, we learned. Oh, they want to shut up already, okay. The Zoom, we have to get off. Okay, we'll okay. go. We'll go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the rabbi, did you see? He appeared. I guess we're still on the Zoom. Okay, bye, my dear. Bye.